accesstv.org, grassroots social media television. Hello, my name is E. Diane Cook, and you are watching AccessTV.org. Enjoy. Welcome back to another program of We Sing. This is Pastor Marcus Nazaya Jarvis. Uh, an awesome word. You, 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 you do not, I repeat, you do not want to switch off this channel until you see the end, at the end. Um, awesome message. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him? Preached by youth pastor and evangelist Alicia Brathwaite. She is a Harford born. She's not an implant. She went down south and got some little seasoning and came back. And uh, you're going to hear an awesome word. And I just want to introduce you to her. She's here with me here at the Upper Room Christian Center in East Hartford, Connecticut, with uh, Pastor Howard Daniels as the presiding angel over the house. Um, uh, Pastor Alicia uh, Brathwater, just, just state your name and tell us about yourself. My name is Youth Pastor Alicia Brathwaite. I serve here at the Upper Room Christian Center, uh, where our pastor is Howard Daniels. Um, you know, we just love the Lord and we love the young people. And it, it's our goal to bring realistic messages that will uh, give people a point where they can relate to God and who He is and what He truly desires to do for us. And most of all, that's to show Himself to be God. So I'm honored and privileged anytime I get a chance to relay a message that He gives me for His people. Now. I, I listen to you preach, you know, you know, the Bible says, know them that labor among you. And, you know, and I discern a lot of different things. And so as I was sitting here, I asked you this question, and we, want, we wanted to save it for this interview because I believe that there's somebody out there that needs to hear it. And the question was, when did the switch take place? When did you go from old Alicia to the new Alicia now? At how? 33, 33. years old. Yes. Um... Well, it was definitely a process, and um, I would say around 17 or 18 years old um, was really when I started focusing on ministry and what it is that God requires of me and the type of relationship that he wanted to establish with me. Mm -hmm. um, it was then that um, I had already received my calling, but I started to really walk in my calling was around 17 or 18, and I started to seek the Lord to find out who He is, not just from what I heard um, or what I felt, but just to really discover who God is. So this was something personal in you. What I did say that you were like, okay, I've heard this, I've seen that, yeah. but what about for myself? Absolutely. You know, I was born and raised um, at the Greater Refuge Church there on Garden Street in Hartford. Um, I served there for 20 years, um, so I was a church baby, and I had heard a lot of things, but I think self-discovery came um, when I was about 17 or 18, and I decided what I had heard wasn't good enough, and I had to find out for myself who this God was. Now, you're also the mother of... Two children. Two children. Yes. Oh, a four-year-old four son. A four-year-old son. Yes, and a six-month-old daughter. And could tell us about that, how, you know... Oh, I moved down south in 2000, and... Uh, I met my husband, and I say we got married in 2010, and my first son was born, Justin Allen, uh, awesome man of God, and just recently, six months ago, November, I had my daughter, um, who was also amazing, so uh, motherhood is definitely another transition, and it opens mm -hmm. up a new perspective into relationship with God. And I, I love it. You know, I now pray for my children and I'm learning how to go from being an auntie into a mother. And that's awesome. Okay. And I heard you, you know, this is one of my 
my um, passions is, is the marriage ministry. Because mm. to me, marriage is the first thing that God establishes in Genesis. It is, it is the basis of the church. It's the only relationship that God says parallels between himself and himself. Absolutely. Christ the bride and the church. And so I heard you, you, you talk a lot about that. Mm -hmm. If you could just expound on it, where did you draw this? Aside from the word, where did you draw your experience, your, your learning, your spiritual growth in terms of... Because I've, I, I hear a lot of older people that have been married 35, 40 years mm -hmm. say these things, but never coming from someone as young as you are. Well, I think when it comes to relationship, you know, I've been married five years um, I think when it comes to relationship, the principles are the same. It's built on things like love, trust, um, getting to know one another. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. It's built on love, trust, getting to know one another, knowing mm -hmm. how God moves, and him you know, letting me know it's okay to be me, mm -hmm. and me letting him know, okay, you are a God of my life. And it's the same thing in marriage. You have to get to know your partner so that y'all can move together. It's kind of like a dance. Now, did you meet your husband up here? I met him in South Carolina. Oh, you see, see she, left, she, left, she, she left all of us, Hartford, Connecticut, and she just went all over. I did. <laughs> Got a country fella. I hear you. I Absolutely. hear you. Absolutely. Now, is he also in the ministry? Or? He he comes to the ministry, but he's not in, you know, he doesn't preach or anything like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and your family? Oh. They're here in, in, in Hartford? Yes. Um, I have a very close-knit family. Um, I have three blood brothers, but I was raised with five boys, and I was the only girl. Um, and my mom and my grandparents... Um, we are all very close knit. I talk to my grandmother, my aunts and uncles on a weekly mm -hmm. basis. Uh, we get together and do dinners and stuff on a weekly basis. So we're all Hartford natives and very close knit. Nice, nice. Listen, I wanted to tell you that it was a an awesome word, an awesome message, an on time message, especially for the times that we're living in. You know, uh, we got. I'm just. I'm. I'm very blunt. People know that already on this on my program. We got a lot of pimps for pastors mm -hmm. and prosperity pimps and and folks practicing religion. You know, we mm -hmm. got a church on every corner. So it was very refreshing to hear a message. And it, and it, and one thing I know about the word is, you know, I always say the Bible is a cash on delivery. C O D. Mm. It's gonna convict, offend, or deliver you. Absolutely. And so I was convicted and delivered today because. I believe that we never get to a point where we read the word and go, okay, I measure up. Right. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says we die daily. We press towards the, you know, so we're constantly, constantly, constantly growing. We, you know, I always say people don't fall in love. They grow in love. True. You know what I'm saying? So as the more we get to know one another, and you talked about this relationship with God, the more intimate it becomes. Oh, absolutely. You know, because I can tell you, you know, I did that sugar daddy fox. So, Lord, if you just <laughs> see me one more time, just one more time, you know. Right. And it's a, it's a, it's something that, uh, a trap that is easy for us to um, fall into. It, it, you know, we are taught to obey rules, regulations, and standards, mm -hmm. but they don't teach us that we need to fall in love with God. Mm -hmm. um, they don't teach us that we need to communicate with God. And these are all basic principles that God wants from us and it makes loving him and serving him easy if we get to know because he's mm -hmm. awesome. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. I shared with you earlier, you know, was married, now divorced, but mm -hmm. 22 years married, six kids, and God's, you know, do it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do it all, yeah. And how old are your children? Um, I have a four-year-old and a six-month-old. Mm -hmm. See, now I can tell you, see, I love... Getting, you know, when we get to the age where we can tell young folks stuff, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm here. Enjoy these years. <laughs> All right. All right. Because when they hit that, when they when the testosterone goes and oh, the da, 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 right now you're a god. Yeah. We're, you know, when, when our children are this age, we're gods to them. It's like, you know, mommy and daddy can do no wrong. Right. Puberty happens. All of a sudden, you become very dumb. <laughs> it's like, man, you don't know what you're talking about. I got this. Yeah, it's something I don't uh, necessarily look forward to. <laughs> I can tell you that, honestly. Um, remembering when I was a teenager, I pray daily that my children, um, you know, <laughs> have mercy on me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, um, last but not least, I just want to say again, 
it's an inspiration to me. I have a daughter your age. Um, I, I can't say that she has the, the intimate relationship that you have, but I hope that she sees this and other uh, young women of her age with children uh, in or not in a marriage, whatever your life circumstance or situation may be, um, you can be used by God and, and God can make a difference and can deliver you. You don't, you know, some folks think that, you know, this walk, this walk of faith we have is for folks who are too old to sin. Mm. But, uh, yeah, you know, some folks, they just, you know, they can't even pick the, the glass up to get a drink. Oh, my goodness. But, um, and so I just want to thank you, you know, for having us here. And now I just want to invite my viewing audience. Listen, like I said, don't turn off this channel because this young woman delivered a powerful, powerful, powerful message based on true biblical principles, and she comes real. And what you see here is not what you're going to hear later. This is Pastor Marcus Messiah Jarvis. We're at, here at the Upper Room Christian Center in East Hartford, Connecticut, with the youth pastor, Alicia Brathwaite. And this is accesstv.org. We sing. Now, some insurance companies brag that they could be on the scene of the accident right after it happens. Whose interest do they have in mind? Yours? I don't think so. You may be one paycheck between you and the street, and you have three children work in another town. You need that car, and you need it fast. If you have an accident, call me. Attorney Jeffrey Dressler, 24-7-11-22.
cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? Let's skip over very briefly to Proverbs chapter number three, verse number five. Let's read five through seven together. When you have it, say amen. amen. Give you another minute. Proverbs meeting following Psalms chapter number three, verse number five. If you have it, say amen. amen. There we go. One, two, three. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Father, we thank you for your already blessed word. We decrease and ask you to increase. Speak now to the hearts and minds of your people. Give us what it is that we need on today. And Father, we will bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name, you may receive your seats with a praise on your mouth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Minister Sylvia. We appreciate you. Thank God for you. And so we find ourselves here in the book of Matthew, chapter number 21. This passage here is actually what they call the beginning of Passion Week. This would be the catalyst that would lead to the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is his great and triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And he commanded his disciples to go and get him an ass cult so that prophecy would be fulfilled. Now, we would think Jesus being a king would ride in the city uh, on a horse or something of that magnitude. But Jesus was not decreeing himself to be king at this time, but it was the judges at the time who would ride in on asses and colts, donkeys, if you will. And so Jesus came in and declared himself as the judge. Hmm. And so look what happens here in verse number seven when they brought it and the Bible says that he sat on it. After that, when he was riding through the city, the Bible declares that a great multitude began to spread their garments in the way. That they began to cut down branches from the trees and lay them in the path so that he can have a clear entry into the city. And they began to cry, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, which means save now, Lord, we beseech thee. Now, Hosanna is a word that is given during joyous occasion. It is a form of praise, but it's a praise that says, save us now. And the unfortunate thing about this is a lot of us have a save us now prayer. Meaning that the only time we find it in our hearts and in ourselves to praise God is when we need something from it. And so it is that there is a blessing when you praise God and don't want nothing from it. Y'all mind if I preach in here just a little while? It's a little tight, but we gonna get it together. And so it was, the, 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 let me give you the topic of this message that God brings to us today. Just look at your neighbor real fast and ask them, do you know him? Amen. Yes, this is a message that God given to us a while ago and he revisits upon us today. Ask yourself, self, do you know him? And so we find a multitude here and they're out there and when he comes in, they are worshiping him as the king. And so to the naked eye, to the one who is unwitting, you would think that these people knew who God was. But the thing and the great thing about the Bible is that it gives us insight. And this same multitude, the same multitude who would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And sometimes at one breath we praise God and we say, Hosanna in the highest, hallelujah, glory be to God, but our lives cry out, crucify him, crucify It's important that we understand that sin hurts God. Because it's not the will of God that any would perish, but that all would have everlasting life. And so when he sees us live a lifestyle of sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Relationship 
relationship is the key to salvation. Now, this is something that the church doesn't teach. They don't teach about relationship. What we teach about is abstaining from sin. But little do we know, if we had a relationship with God, we would want to abstain from sin. When you are in a love relationship with someone, it makes you want to make them happy. And if a lot of us would fall in love with Jesus, then we would want to make him happy and not sinning wouldn't be so hard. But the problem is when we receive the salvation of God, we try not to sin rather than to fall in love. But people of God, I beseech you, hearers of God, I dare you to form a relationship with God and you will find it easier not to sin. That's right. That's right. Do you know him? The multitude mentality, they knew him in a way because they knew what they had heard about this Jesus, about this Messiah. They knew that he was a miracle worker. They had heard of some of the things that he had done. They heard that he was a healer. They heard that he was raising people from the dead. These are all things that they heard about the man. And it's the multitude mentality that rests in a lot of religious organizations today. We know what we heard about God, but our personal experience with him is limited. Now the Bible declares that when he came into the city, the entire city was moved by the presence of God. And a lot of us, when God comes into the room, we're moved by his presence. But just because we're moved by his presence does not mean that we know him. And so when you have this multitude mentality, the spirit of the living God comes in the room and everything in you is shaken or moved. And that's why you have people who come to the altar and they may fall out, God bless you. You have people who come to the altar and they may cry out, God bless you. And they find themselves back in the same situation they were in because they were moved. But the day and time in which we are living in is one where the move of God is not enough because after I've been moved by God, understand when I go back outside those doors, I'm going to be moved by something else. And if I don't know who Jesus is, if I don't have a relationship with him myself, I'm going to be moved by those things also. Can I get a witness? And so people of God, it's important that we just don't know God for the things that we've been taught. It's important that we know God for more than what our mamas said. A lot of us, a lot of us serve God based on what other people say. Pastor says, God doesn't want you to do this. Mama said, God doesn't want you to dress like this. And my grandma said, we don't do this. And our relationship with God is that of an absentee parent. We love him as much as they told us about him. But we do not know him. The multitude mentality. What you hear about God should motivate you to want to form a relationship with him. But it should not drive you to want to live for him because you'll fail. If you really want to live for God, you have to seek him while he may be found. Now look at what the multitude did though. The multitude was okay because the multitude, they made sacrifices. And that's how some of us are. We make sacrifices for God. The multitude took off their clothes and laid them in the street. The multitude went and cut down branches and strewed them together and laid them in the street. And they paved the way. And some of us have paved the way. Or we know people who have paved the way for this great gospel. But they still lack relationship. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. A lot of us have made sacrifices, but we still don't have relationship. In the word of God, it says in the last day, many shall come to me saying, Lord, Lord, I cast 
demons in your name. I prophesied in your name. And what does the Bible say? He looks at them and says, I profess that I never knew you. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to get to know who he is. It's not just about what you've heard. It's not just about how you were moved, but it's about the relationship that you formed with him. It was this multitude who sacrificed to him. This multitude who praised him out of their desperation. It was this same group that in John couldn't help themselves but to move with the rest of the multitude and say, crucify him. It's the multitude mentality. We cannot get caught up in the actions of others. I see this one live like this. Surely, this is how God wants me to live. I see mother dress like this. Surely, this is how God wants me to dress. Oh, sister sings like this. Surely, this is how God wants me to sing. But see, what relationship is relationship outlines a plan between you and God. What relationship does is it gives God an opportunity to speak to you and give you direction. How is it do I know that I have a relationship with God? The first one is very simple. Do we acknowledge God? The Bible says in all our ways we acknowledge him and what happens? He directs our path. Now, this is something that married people can get in people who are in love relationships. It's easy. Good morning. Good morning. What you got to do today? Got to go to work. See you after work. You acknowledge your spouse. Now, the cupcakes. When you're a teenager, good morning. <laughs> you going to school today? Yeah, my mama was tripping. I got to go. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to see you at lunch. What period is lunch? I don't know, but I'll see you. I'll catch you in the hallway. All right, so text me and let me know what you're doing after school. Okay, you acknowledge them. So it's easy for us to acknowledge the ones who we love. And so if we love God, why don't we acknowledge him? Listen, it's time out for us to think that we love God. It's time out for us to think that we know God and we need to have infallible proof that we know who God is. We need to have infallible proof that we know that Jesus is our savior. We need to have infallible proof that we are in love with Jesus. Do you acknowledge him? When you wake up in the morning, do you acknowledge that God even exists? Or do you just get up and go about your day? Imagine if you were married to a man laying in your bed and you get what that happens, that's bad. And you get out of your bed and don't even acknowledge that he exists. Imagine if you were married to a woman and all day long you don't call and see if she's breathing not once. Brother Troy said for us that would be a problem. Imagine if you're supposed to be connected with someone and they don't even acknowledge your presence. Do you acknowledge God? Because when you wake up and you love God, the first thing you do, good morning, Jesus. The first thing you do, you know what, God? I thank you because I woke up. You acknowledge God in some way. But don't you tell me you love God and you don't acknowledge him. At some point throughout the day, your mind should roll back to Christ. The old folk used to say all day long, my mind has been stayed on Jesus. Because they had relationship. Hmm. Do we acknowledge God? There's another mentality alongside the multitude, uh, uh, multitude mentality that I like to call the trophy wife syndrome. All right, now. You know the trophy wife. Thing look good. That trophy wife, before she walks out the house, the husband didn't speak to her all day, but when it's time to go out, the husband does a full examination, yeah. head to toe. Hair, nails, makeup, dress, shoes, 
you good, let's go. While out in public, she's close to him, on his arm. It's my baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, you like them, I bought those, yeah, yeah. It's his showpiece. He takes her out in public, and he shows her off, and he brings her home, and he escorts her in the house, and he doesn't talk to her until it's time for the next event. She makes him dinner. He doesn't acknowledge. She tries to whisper sweet nothings in his ear. He doesn't acknowledge. The only time he acknowledges her is when he needs intimacy or when it's time for a showcase. And so his love for her is driven by showing her off or fulfilling his needs. And so it is, this is the mentality of some of us in the church. We have trophy wife syndrome. When we come to church, we acknowledge who God is. We jump and we shout and we say, he's my savior. And we show him off. When it's time for us to go out and preach, look at my gift. Look at what God has given to me. Isn't it wonderful? Aren't we fabulous? Trophy wife syndrome. Well, brothers, don't worry. Because there's another syndrome. And we call that, since Sabrina, we don't know too much about this. This is the sugar daddy syndrome. Sweet like candy. And see, the thing about the sugar daddy is he supplied all your needs according to his riches and glory. Can I get a witness? Look at all the women. Amen. Some of you are missing your sugar daddy right now. Cut it out. Me in the world. And so it's the job of the sugar daddy to provide for you. That's his only job. Sugar daddy doesn't come out in public. Sugar daddy doesn't get put on display. Sugar daddy is kept in secret and nobody is to know about the sugar daddy. The sugar daddy is the one who sits home and says, what do you need? Here it is, money on the dresser. That is the job of the sugar daddy is to provide sugar for his sweetness. And some of us treat God as if he's a sugar daddy. God, I saw these shoes right, Jesus. And you said you would be my Jehovah Jireh. That's what you said, God. You said that you would supply my every need according to your riches and glory. And I seen some red bottoms with a bag. Jesus. I love you, I'll magnify you, I'll praise you if you give this to me. Because you know I really love you, right? I'm getting ready to go out. You don't get to ask what I do when I go out. That's just my friend picking me up in the car. Don't even worry about that, that's just a friend. You know I'm coming home to you, sugar daddy. And we go out and we live how we wanna live until we need something and we come back to our sugar daddy. Do you know him? Or is he your sugar daddy? With the sugar daddy and the trophy wife, the syndrome is the same. There's no intimate knowledge of who they are. What they like is not important unless you need it to get something from them. Now the problem with this is when you're in church and you find out that somebody in your family has been stricken with a disease, you go running to sugar daddy. When you find out that your children are facing time in prison, that's when you want to put your trophy wife on display. God is sick of it. In the words of Mary J. Blige, he's looking for a real love. And it's important that we all come into self-examination this morning and say, do I really love God or do I love what he does for me? Do I really know God? What exactly do you even know about God? 
What you know about God can be proven and it's easy because what you know about God is reflected through trials and tribulations. Just like any love relationship, when it is tried and tested, it shows you how deep that love is. If you want to know if you love somebody, wait till they start acting up. That's where your love is proven. When that gal stay out late and ain't answering her phone and you calling her, oh, your love is being tried. Ain't even cook your dinner, bro. Get out. <laughs> when that man has a battery on his phone that just doesn't stay charged. <laughs> Every time I call, I get the voicemail. Every time I call, I get the voicemail. This is what we do. <laughs> then you mad because I called to say hello. Hey, baby. What up? It's called to say I love you. I will hit you back later. And later never comes. Oh, if you want to know if you love somebody, you got to be tried. When that girl say, I want to go to school, I think I want to do hair, nails, nursing, culinary, all at the same time. What? Or when that man gets that great vision, right? So don't bug out, cause I quit my job. But wait, I got a plan. We got 10 kids. And you got a plan? <laughs> what? Oh, your love is gonna be sure enough tried then. Now listen to what the Bible says. And this will help every married person in America. Everyone. The Bible says that love covereth a multitude of sin. And so when he quits his job and he got a plan, you'd be like, what? Um, who? What is your plan? When your boyfriend start acting up, if you really love them, that's why you end up with girls who stay in abusive relationships. Men who stay in relationships where they're neglected because they have a genuine love. And that love is blinding them to what's really going on. And that's the thing I love about God, is he loves us so much, sometimes it blinds him to what we're really doing. It blinds him to the fact that we're neglecting him. It blinds him to the fact that we say we love him with our mouth, but our hearts are far from us. That love that God has for you is blinding him to who we really are. And the only thing he sees is who we are going to be. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is why it's important that we fall in love with Jesus, because love leads to trust. And some of us don't trust that God is going to make everything all right. And when you lose or lack trust in God, you need to check your love levels. So after you love him, it'll lead to trust. And trust leads to something we call reliance. And this is the state in which God wants us to get to, is a state of reliance. It's a state where we rely on him to meet our every needs. Where we rely on him to make sure everything is all right. Where we rely on God to be our lover when we feel we're not loved. Where we rely on God to give us what it is that we're missing. But we can't get to the state of reliance because we don't have trust. And we don't have trust because we don't have love. And we don't have love because we never took the time to get to know Jesus. So it's important to us that we find out who God is. How do we do this? Hmm. Well, before I get there, another way to know if you know God, other than do you acknowledge him, is do we consult with God? 
does he has a say in what goes on in our everyday life? Or do we jump into a routine and we rely on our routine? What would happen if we woke up in the morning and say, God, what is it that you would have me to do today? What if we woke up in the morning and we questioned God? God, how can I make you happy today? What if we question God and say, God, what can I do to make our love relationship stronger? Do we consult God and does he get a say? Because sometimes we consult God, hmm? we ask him questions and we answer. God, should I go? Yes, I'm going. Thank you, deuces. And we do this out of ignorance because we never took the time to know him. So we don't know what his voice sounds like. We don't know what it's like when he moves outside of the sanctuary. Can I get a witness? Do you consult God? And does he get a say? Or do you direct your own path? Because it's easy. Humanity says that we know what's best for us. I know what I need. I got this. The only thing you want is for God to provide things that you feel like you need to go the way that you should go. And you never asked him, God, where should I go and give me what I need to get there? Yeah. We want to take this great, big, wonderful God and put him into our small box of a mind. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. The Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. The Bible also says that our ways, they are not his ways. And our thoughts, they are not his thoughts. And if you know God, you would know this and you would consult him. Do you know him? How, Mr. Ross, do I get to know God? Well, the first thing is to open a dialogue with him. Great things start with a conversation. There has been peace brought to nations by opening a dialogue. At the same time, there has been war brought to nations by the lack of a dialogue. If you want to formulate a relationship with God and not just be moved by his presence, open a dialogue with him. Talk, believing and knowing that he hears you. First John chapter number five, verse 14. It says, and this is the confidence that if we ask God anything according to his word and his will, we know that he hears us. And so the adversary would have you to believe that God does not hear you when you pray. And that leads me to the second thing. After you open a dialogue, you read about him in the book. The Bible says, behold, I come in the volume of the book. If you want to know about this great God that you serve, if you want to know his history, if you want to know what he's done for others, if you want to know what he's going to do for you, shout, get in the book. The second thing is give him input on our lives. Allow God room and space to direct your life. Don't be so starch and rigid to where you have a vision. Seek the vision of God. Let him have a say. It's just like any relationship when you would allow a man to start to have input in your life. When you allow a woman to have input in your life. Baby, should I wear the gray socks or the brown socks? Because you want to make sure you look good, not just for everybody else, but for her. Boo, you like the red dress or the yellow one? What you wearing? And allow him to have that input in your life. It's the same thing with God. What you want me to look like today? What is it that you would have me to adorn myself? How can you get glory from me? Hallelujah. Allow God to have input. Now the Bible says in 2 John chapter number 1, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. 
Now, people of God, don't get scared, don't get nervous, because now we're talking about those rules and regulations. But when you love someone, it's not hard to please them. And the reason why commandments, we see them as restricting rules, binding regu regulations, is because we're not in love with God. When you are in love with someone, you'll do anything for them. Laying clothes and strawing sticks, that's nothing compared to what you'll do if you're in love with someone. When you're in love with someone, you take the time to get to know where they've been, where they're going, and what's going on with them. And as Christians, this is the place that we need to get to, where we get to know who God is so we can fall in love with him, gain trust in him, and begin to rely on him. We all read the scripture, cast your cares on him for he careth for you. But the reason why we don't do this is because we don't trust him. Yeah. So don't tell me to bring my burdens to the Lord and leave them there. How do I know he going to do something with them? Yeah. Well, you don't unless you know him. Yeah. And if you knew him, <laughs> if you knew him, then he would tell you when you brought your burdens, he would say, listen. It's my will that you be in good health and that you prosper, even as your soul shall prosper. Do you know him? Second thing, rather the third thing you have to do after you open up a dialogue, after you give him input in your life, is you have to turn to God. This is one for seasoned Christians. It's difficult still. That is fasting. Y'all don't mind if I get into the old school principles. I'm talking about prayer, praise, and fasting. The principles are the same, just giving them to you a different way. Put a little applesauce on the spoon. Turn to God. And the way that we turn to God is through fasting. Why? Because what fasting does is it turns you from everything else and turns you to God. But the problem is a lot of us fast inappropriately. We turn our plate down, but we leave everything else open. We don't eat, but we still feed on natural things. Sitting there hungry, watching the Food Network. Look at that burger. I got 15 more minutes. I'm about to get me one of them. movie I wanted to watch, right? I'm going to just watch it because I'm fast and I can't really eat or nothing anyway, so I'm going to just watch this movie. What do you think is about to happen? You are setting yourself up for failure. But fasting is about relationship. It's about turning away from everything, including natural substance, and turning directly to God. All I see is God. Everything I read is about God. My conversation reflects God. Ain't thinking about you. Ain't thinking about nobody else. Only thing I'm trying to do is turn to God. I'm in a constant state of prayer. All at work at my desk, I'm not thinking about what nobody's saying because I have to focus on God and getting this work done so I can get home and talk to God and love on my lover, which is God. Gotta get this done so I can get out of here. True fasting. It's not about what you're turning away from, but it's what you're turning. It's not about what you're giving up. It's about what you're gaining. What am I gaining? I'm gaining the world. And what does the word do? It allows me to build a closer relationship and get information about the God that I serve. I wish y'all knew I was preaching in here this morning. In Joel chapter number two, verse 12, he says, it's turn to me with all your heart through fasting. 
Lastly, is we have to enter into this love relationship with pure intentions, not desiring other things, but only God. Yeah. Because some of us come to the altar and we want to form a relationship with God to get away from something. We want to form a relationship with God, not so that we can get to know him and fall in love with him, but we need him to do some stuff in our lives. Yeah. Some of us want to formulate a relationship with God because of what we lack. Yeah. That will bring you into the sugar daddy mentality. Yeah. That girl ain't intend to make that man her sugar daddy. She need help paying her rent. So if he move in, he paid the rent. Whether she love him or not is irrelevant. Her needs is being met. Sugar daddy mentality. But when you read in Mark chapter 4 about the seed that fell on the stony ground, right? But that word that fell on stony ground, the word says it was choked by the thorns. And what happens is some of us try to form a relationship with God, but our love relationship is being choked out by what we need. Because that's what's on the forefront of our mind. Not forming a love relationship with God, but what we want from God. And that's why we're in a relationship with him. So it's choking your spirituality. Do you know him? Hmm. There are certain things that we should know about God that would tell us, are we in love with him or not? How we treat him. Do we listen to him? And so now, we should all take a brief evaluation and just ask yourself, what type of love relationship do I really have with God? And the spirit of repentance should fall on some of us because we've been taking advantage of God. We've wanted what he has to offer, but we don't want him. He is a God of love and of peace who wants to provide for you, but that's not why he's in your life. He wants to deliver you, but that's not why he's in your life. Listen, when man was created, his intentional design, it was not created so that he could deliver him. Man was created so he could love him. And so what happened was man got in himself and God said, you know what? I created you so I could love you and you could love and worship me. You got in some mess. I'm going to deliver you because I want to keep the love relationship. Huh? It was a song by William Murphy. That says I was created just to worship and adore him. And God wanted someone who would love him unconditionally on their own. He wanted a people who would choose to love him. Not for what he provided, but for who he is. And what kind of people are we? Are we the type of people who love God because that's what we're created to do? Or are we the type of people who love God because of what's in the garden? Do you know him? As young people, it's easy to want to fit in with everybody else. But in high school, when I got a boyfriend, I didn't care who I fit in with. All that mattered was what he thought about me. I went to school to see him. After school, it was about him. Couldn't focus on my books and my homework because my entire life were rounded around this boy. You get fights behind him, you get arguments behind him, you make crazy life changes for a boy. boy. Ain't got a job, and if he do, it can't even pay rent. I loved it in him. <laughs> See, y'all think I don't know what love is. I know what love is. Love, 
according to a teenager. It's not till you hit about 30 years old that you really find out what true love is all about. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All the teens like, oh, my youth pastor, you just messed up right there. And I was with you until that. But what happens is, as people with age, we evolve. And as we evolve, our needs evolve. And as teens, what we do, our love relationship is based off of what we need emotionally. But what you need emotionally at 16, 17, 18 is way different than what you need at 30. See, at 30, you start getting into validation and you think I'm cute? Am I still pretty to you? Sorry, brothers, it's just how it works. Brothers be in the mirror. Oh. Baby, you think I'm getting bigger? <laughs> I think I need a motorcycle. What? <laughs> Ten kids. <laughs> and you want a motorcycle. <laughs> Look at my car like, see you messing me up. <laughs> just talking to my wife about that the other day. <laughs> People of God, do you know him? Hmm. Do you really know who God is? Do you know what it is that God requires from you? What God requires from me as an individual is different than what God requires of you. It's certain things that God wants from me in regards to our love relationship that he may not require of you. You know, sometimes, I don't think God want me to sing to him all the time. In the shower, right? I think he's okay with the shower. I sound great in the shower. You know, I, sound, I don't know about everybody. I'm talking about me, Brother Troy. Okay? I could create a whole album in the shower. And I think it'll go platinum because I'm just that dope in the shower. I'm good. I got this. I wish I had a booth in the shower because I would tear it apart. This is what I do in the shower. All right? I will sing a hot 16 quick in the shower. Perfect tone, pitch, harmony, everything. I does that in the shower. But sometimes when I get out, he might want me to stick to praying or something. Amen. He might. He might want me to stick to studying his word because that's where I'm at. Now for people who like Sister Brown, who has that Maloney's thing out the shower, he may want a song in the night. He may want to wake her up in the middle of the night and say, girl, sing to me. Worship me. Some people got a nice dance. Mine is, uh, <laughs> I'm more of a bopper kind of thing, you know, it's what I do though, but I'm good at my bop. Mm. Yeah, God, you do what you do. You know, get my little twirl on, yeah. But see, for Didi, he might want her to do, 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 do. He might put shouting music in her head. She at home sleep, she wake up. <laughs> Hey girl, you know what? I need you to dance before the king. Go ahead and do what you do. See? My prayers sound kind of like an 80 year old deacon sometimes. <laughs> Father God, we want to thank you, God. Father Jacob, Isaac, Joseph, Mary, DJ Quick, Reverend Molly Mo. Reverend Run, we thank you, Father. Now let the tongue cleave to our roof of our mouth. God! See, Sister Justine might get on her knees and be praying and be like, God, <laughs> hey, boo. <laughs> Glory. Now you know, God, they need you because your people is toe up. <laughs> so he may wake Sister Justine up in the middle of the night and say, pray. People like me, you might
somebody say, I got a message for my people. Get up, we give you this message. We gonna try this out. And I wake up and be like, yes, God and Lord. Because that's what I do. What God requires from me is based on my love relationship with him. And what God requires from you, people of God, is based on your love relationship with him. Come on, let's stand up to our feet. Give me a favor and just look at someone and say, do you know him? Now ask yourself, do you know him? And I want you to answer this question in your own mind. Do you need to change the basis of your relationship with God? Do you need to rebuild the foundation of what your love was built on? Do you have the multitude mentality to where you sacrifice based on who you were told he was, but you never study or you never talk to him to find out who he truly is? Do you have the trophy wife syndrome where in public he is your God and your savior, but at home he's not even acknowledged? Do you have the sugar daddy mentality to where you truly have affection for him as long as he's providing for you in the way that you want? Are you moved by his presence or do you live by his love? What is your relationship with God really like? Is he pleased with your worship? Is he pleased with your praise? Is he pleased with your life living? Or is he being neglected? Just like you check on your spouse and say, baby, are you happy in this relationship? When was the last time you asked God, were you happy in this relationship? Now I know I didn't stand on chairs and I didn't do a bunch of hooping and hollering, but the message stands short. Do you know him? Today, I challenge you to get to know God. Not only by studying his word, but the first thing you have to do is open a dialogue with him. And after you open a dialogue with him, you have to allow him to speak back to you and give you input on what it is he wants you to let go of right. and what it is he wants you to reach out to. Right. If God speaks to you and says, stop smoking, cut it out. Because if you love him, you will do what it takes to make sure he's happy. Amen. You have to turn to God uh -huh. through fasting. Ooh, this is that old school stuff. And you have to enter into this relationship with a pure heart and a pure mind. Not wanting anything but his love. Not wanting anything to give him your love. See, when you love somebody, it's not just about receiving their love, but it's about what you want to give to them. When you are in love with somebody, you want to give them absolutely all of you. There's nothing that you wouldn't do for the one that you love. What would you do for God if you really love him? Would you give him your life? Because for God so loved the world that he gave his. No greater love has man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. The multitude laid down clothes and sticks, but none of them laid themselves in the street. Have you laid yourself down at the altar of God? I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Yes, 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 yes. Deliver 
deliverance and salvation is the gifts, they're the perks that come with being in a relationship with God. Amen. Amen. God loved me so much that he went away to build me a mansion. That's right. so what he did. Because he wants to give me everything. Yes. Some of us got husbands who love us so much they build us houses. It's on the way. It's on the way. <laughs> Some of us who have wives who love us so much, they give you them 10, 12 kids. Not in this house. <laughs> They'll pop them out, barefoot, pregnant. That's what you want, that's what you get. Cook, clean, all that. Jesus, help me even now, right where I stand. But what a woman gives to her husband is what a husband wants. What a husband gives to a woman is what, this is for the married people. If you're watching my back and I'm watching your back, we both cover. That's right. But what happens is we want God to watch our back and we want to watch our back. We want God to provide our needs and we want to take those needs and use them how we want to. So what are you doing for him? What have you done for God this week? How many times have you told him thank you? That's right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Really? That's right. Listen, I'm a realist. Spooky and spectacular is not what I do. I want to bring you into something that is real. And what is real is that God wants a relationship with you. What is real is that God is real. Once you're moved by his presence, seek him for relationship. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. And people of God, this morning, God wants us to seek a relationship with him. He wants us to look for him and ask him, what do you want? Because what happens is while you're looking for him saying, what do you want? The Bible says he seeketh such as to worship him. And so while you're looking for him and you feel lost, he's looking for you and you're looking for each other. And a great collision happens. And not only are you saved and sanctified, but you can live as a Christian and be happy. Yeah. happy. There are so many miserable Christians. Yes. Oh, come on now. How can you serve a God so great and be so miserable? How can you be trapped in these relationships for so long and be so miserable and never try to fix it? The one thing I like about God is when you go to him and say, God, we have to fix this relationship because I'm not happy. He says, okay, baby, this is what we need to do. Somebody today needs to fix your love relationship with God. Somebody today needs to establish a love relationship with God. Put the trophy wife syndrome down, the multitude syndrome down, sugar daddy syndrome down. Today we start over. Happy anniversary. Sunday, May 24th. It's a great anniversary day for you and God. One day in 2015, girl, May 24th, I started this thing with God, like for real. I really started seeking him and asking him what he wanted from me. And ever since then, I've been a happy Christian. I haven't been depressed. We go through things, but guess what? He makes it all right. And so today, I'm going to ask if you need a renewed relationship with God. If you need to come into a right relationship with God. And you want to say, God, we need to start this thing all over again. Sometimes it takes a person to bring two people together okay. and say, y'all need to talk. And this morning, God sent me here with a message for somebody here that says, 
we need to talk. Today, if you want to start, May 24, if you want to start your love relationship over with God, I'm going to ask you to form one line down that center aisle right here. And what I want to do is I want to touch and I want to agree with you. And I want to expose you to the presence of God. And as we expose you to his presence, I want you to begin to talk to God. Now, ministers, come to me. Come. No, no, no. Sister Ross. Mrs. Ross, come to me. Come, come. Come to me. Put your hands. Father, we pray that you would anoint these hands. Everyone they touch and minister to, Father, we pray that they would bring you into their presence. Allow them, God, to make a connection with you. Touch right now. Even as they walk in their calling and their vocation. Anoint them with power. And bring them close to you. That all men may be drawn near. Do this for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you all to line here. Yes, anoint the minister. Open a die. 